Okay, I think we are recording now, we are live. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Luis Luis Pessoa. I um, have been organizing the Neuroscience and Philosophy Salon for maybe a year now or a year and a half. And the goal of the salon is really to try to foster dialogue between neuroscience and philosophy as the name says, try to look at these, these extremes as a part of a continuum where each can inform the other. Neuroscientists can be encouraged to think conceptually and, 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 and use concepts that have been developed in, in, in philosophy. And the philosophies can build their ideas from, from, this, from science and, and not just something uh, based from pure intuition as sometimes they, they describe it. So today we have a little bit of a different event. Uh, it's, um, we're going to have not, we're not gonna have a presentation, a formal presentation itself. Uh, we're gonna have a, a slightly different event, but what I'm going to do now is pass the baton to Nicole Russ, the professor uh, in the psychology department at University of Pennsylvania, who is going to be introducing the topic and the speakers, or I should say the discussants. And after that, we're gonna have um, a, discuss, a discussion for the next um, hour, hour and a half, or however long people last and, and want to stay around. Uh, so Nicole, uh, wanna take it away? Yeah, sure, thanks Louise. So I am so excited this is happening. Uh, Louise and I, we, we share this idea, this notion that brain research will be facilitated, its progress will be facilitated by these community-based discussions, which we really try to hammer down on the conceptual issues and really focus on talking you know, to each other as opposed to past one another, as I think uh, so often can happen in, in, in science at large. So really excited to talk about a, a topic that we think will benefit a lot from this, and that is the topic of brain waves. So I don't think anyone denies the existence of waves in the brain. If you've ever seen a recording from a brain, you just the first thing that jumps out at you is how it's dominated by these oscillations at different frequencies. Those are brain waves. The question is, what role do those brain waves play? And do they causally influence brain activity? Do they have a causal influence on behavior? Or are they more epiphenomenological? So to quote Ken Miller, are they like rattles of an old car driving down the road, reflective of the car's constituents, but not its function, right? So that's, that's the question we're here today to discuss. Uh, just a note on the emphasis and the need in this forum to keep things really conceptual. We only have an hour or an hour and a half here, so we're not going to be able to do a deep dive on things, but we think that the, the community will benefit most uh, from a discussion at that conceptual level. So just as a guideline, I suggest that everyone think about the clarity with which you would talk to, say, a first-year graduate student, a really smart individual who doesn't yet know about this topic. That's the level of concept that we're going for. And while other topics really need that deep dive, so you know, certainly it's relevant, like exactly what biophysics shape the LFP, deep dives into that sort of topic will need to be discussed, I think, in, in a different venue, not this one. So yeah, please keep it conceptual. So with that, really excited to have three experts guide us through this thorny territory today. All three of them have expertise at the nexus of brain activity and behavior, complex non-trivial behaviors, using a combination of experimental and computational approaches. So first up, we're gonna to have Tony Zador, who is a professor at Cold Spring Harbor. Tony's work has focused in part on the auditory system and complex behaviors in rodents. And he's gonna be channeling the voice of what I would call the agnostic. I'll let you tell him what he does and does not think, but he'll be channeling the voice of the agnostic when it comes to brainwaves. Earl Miller is a professor at MIT. His work has focused in part on cognitive processing in non-human primates. He's long been a proponent of the role of brainwaves in supporting processes like working memory and cognitive flexibility. And last but not least, we have Leslie Kay, who is a, a professor at the University of Chicago. So Leslie's work is focused in part on the olfactory system of rodents and the role the brainwaves play in supporting that olfactory processing. And in addition to her extensive publication record on this topic, her enthusiasm for brainwaves is reflected by her famous tattoo. So with that, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Tony. All right, well, thanks very much, 
Louise and Nicole for organizing this and Nicole for the um, introduction and Leslie and Earl and everyone else for joining us. Um, I think a lot of this discussion um, is about how we use words. And I got, I got to say that on the Twitter, um, uh, the sprawling Twitter discussion that spawned all this, I was often not clear what people meant by different things. And to drive that point home, I wanted to just play a very brief clip um, from the wise words of Jordan Peterson, who when asked, what do you mean? Do you believe in God? Here's what he said. I hope you guys can all hear this. Oh, oh you can hear it. Uh, we can't hear. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, it, so Jordan Peterson, for those of you who don't know, is a complete pompous ass. And when asked, <laughs> um, what, do you believe in God? He said, what do you mean by do? What do you mean by believe? What do you, no, what do you mean by do? What do you mean by you? What do you mean by believe? What do you mean by in? And what do you mean by God? Um, nonetheless, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that you guys, I'll, I'll uh, put the little um, link to that tweet in the in the chat. So um, nonetheless, I think that that's where we are. And I think we would do well if we could kind of, we're using words, because I think that had a lot to do with how we were, uh, why we were talking past each other often. So I wanted to just say a few words about how I was using these words, and I'm happy to change how I use them. Um, but most important, I just I feel like I should try to understand better how um, other people use them. So first of all, there's some discussion of what do we mean by an LFP? And as an experimentalist, what I mean by an LFP, like operationally, is the fluctuations in uh, the electric field that I get at the tip of the electrode. Now, based on like that for me is the LFP. It's the thing that I record at the tip of my electrode when I set my filters to a particular way. And I've recorded those and many other people have recorded those. Um, now, we, we know roughly speaking what those, uh, LF, those fluctuations are due to. They're due to some weighted sum of neural activity, both local neural activity and long range. In, in general, they probably reflect mostly postsynaptic activity. We don't need to resolve that now. For the purposes of this discussion, I would say that um, they're just a, a weighted sum of the aggregate activity of a bunch of neurons. I, am, um, I, I think it's also worth noting that although there are very convenient weighted sum of aggregate neural activity, there are many other ways that you can summate or monitor populations of neurons. You can, uh, you can um, monitor them one at a time with lots of methods, single neuropixel recordings that give you the individual activities of all of them. But there are other experimental methods that weight neural activity, summed neural activity in a different way. And I've been um, excited about, for example, optical local field potentials, which are basically like a local field potential, except they are the aggregate activity of a specific population that we've targeted by introducing a calcium indicator or some other kind of indicator in them. And so I'm a, a great fan of teasing apart the um, local act activity through these different aggregate measures. Um, so I think we could talk more about different ways of summating and the relationship between the individual activity and the aggregate activity. The other sort of topic that I thought we could touch upon is what does it mean for the LFP to cause something? Now there's a physical meaning of causality, which is a faptic communication, right? So the electric fields can in principle cause neurons to fire. I, I um, this has been an idea that's been around for you know half a century or more, and there's a lot of discussion of it. I think most of us agree that that can be an effect. Um, whether it's a big effect or not is an experimental question. But I think the notion of causality that's more interesting for this discussion is the notion of what it means for some aggregate measure to cause some function rather than the constituent component. So at some level, quarks cause everything. You can boil everything down to quarks. And if you know what your quarks are doing, you know everything. 
or if you atoms or whatever. So you can keep digging down. So what we really want is what is the right conceptual level to describe what's going on? And I think from my point of view, and I'll, I'll, I'll close now because I think I've even gone over time, that um, my usual approach is to, uh, is, to, is to recognize that these higher level aggregate measures, although they can be very useful, never losing sight of the fact that they are the result of a bunch of these lower level um, measures in terms of individual spikes. So that's, that's where I'd sort of like to leave things. I'm handing it over to someone. Earl, I think that's you now. Okay. Um, well, I agree with um, everything Tony said, except that, you know, things aren't just a sum of their aggregate parts. That's what emergent properties are. They're, they're, they're a phenomenon you could observe at the aggregate level that you can't um, um, study at the individual level. That's what emergent properties are. And if the brain doesn't have emergent properties, I don't know what does. I think that my um, general premise is that no one knows enough about the brain to call anything an epiphenomenon at this point. And this is certainly true of a signal that closely tracks cognitive function and reflects the organization, the large scale organization of spiking. When someone says X is an epiphenomenon, I hear X doesn't fit my theories and science shouldn't be about defending what you, what you think you know, because we don't know anything now. We're still push, pushing forward. And, you know, uh, we'll call them LFPs, we, we'll call them brain waves or electrical fields. What they reflect is large scale, organized, synchronized changes in excitability across, across the brain. And these generate electrical fields that you can measure outside the skull 100 years ago. And what, what do those electrical fields do? Is they, they move membrane potentials up and down. They move them closer to the spiking threshold and further away from the spiking threshold. You start with the premise that's, that's going to have, have an effect. You know, I think dismissing it is, is the uh, is again this bit of, bit of paradigm uh, defending. I mean, brain function must involve the large scale organization spiking. It has to. Like, I'm not talking about the neuromuscular junction or you know detailed functions of neurons and petri dishes. I'm talking about how the brain wor works in general. It, the, what we're doing right now can't be just activity ping ponging around these fixed synaptic weights or slowly changing synaptic. Weights. Something's got to organize the brain on the fly. And rhythms are a great way, way to do that. These, ch these synchronized changes in an electrical field. And this, nature does this all the time. I mean, you look for examples everywhere. Fireflies flashing at night, they'll spontaneously um, synchronize their, their rhythms and they'll spontaneously go away. So, you know, rhythms are a great way for the brain to produce self-organization and it makes perfect sense that evolution would take that, something that's organizing itself anyway, and use it to really organize the brain in, in a top-down goal-directed way. I mean, I don't know what the alternative is for, for um, flexible goal-directed behavior. Is it a gazillion gates on a gazillion neurons coordinating that? No, you can coordinate the, the scale by which we're talking about, these LFPs organizing um, spiking activity at different frequencies and different spatial distributions. I mean, that's exactly the kind of organization you need to produce the kind of brain that's doing the kind of thing we're doing, doing right now. And these, this is not magic. It's all known laws of physics. And any arguments about, well, you know, actual potentials are big and LFPs are small, that's true for a single neuron, but the brain's not single neuron. The brain is a million, they're all packed together, all synchronizing, all synchronizing their activity. These effects add up and they're nonlinear. I mean, I, I think they, I think we start with the premise that these kind of things make a difference. We don't, uh, we don't treat that as an epiphenomenon. So that's my opening statement. Great. Thanks. Uh, Leslie. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I kind of land in the middle between Earl and, and Tony in some ways, but our discussion online has has swayed me a little closer to Earl's uh, point of view. I've used LFPs in my um, work for thirty some years, um, and you know, really, the best place to study them, and as the best place to study anything in the brain, uh, is the olfactory bulb. Um, they were first seen there back in the nineteen forties by Adrian, and you know, it, it, LFPs represent especially when they're coherent, the cooperative activity among large groups of neurons, right? And they also represent the, um, the, the organization of spiking. But there are lots of neurons that don't spike in the brain um, or that spike rarely. 
and they still do stuff. And so the LFP gives us a window into the, the uh, functional relevance and the forces driven by those neurons um, because you really couldn't stick an intracellular electrode in an olfactory bulb granule cell and carry it for any great amount of time in a freely moving animal, although there's some been a few attempts. Um, so about 60 years ago, Walter Freeman started interrogating the, the circuitry that supports LFP in the olfactory bulb. And I'm just going to give you a few highlights um, as an example for how the LFP gives us more insight. It tells us what state a cort cortical area is in um, because all the neurons are, are, co are cooperating in this state. It tells us um, whether they're doing the same thing as they were a moment ago or they're doing a different thing and what that thing is. So in the um, olfactory bulb, uh, and my famous tattoo, which works as well upside down as right side up because it's a bipolar field, um, we see 500 milliseconds of a rat's life where he takes a couple of sniffs of an odor and gamma oscillations are evident. And then the system abruptly changes to this beta oscillation. We know from lots of experiments and lots of labs that the gamma state is a local state that organizes activity very precisely. And when gamma oscillations are bigger, the underlying uh, neural uh, cells spike in a more precise fashion where they can drive downstream neurons better. And when those gamma oscillations are bigger, animals are better at fine odor discrimination. When they're suppressed or, or ablated, animals are bad at fine odor discrimination. We know this across phyla, in fact. Um, and the beta oscillation, the, so the gamma oscillation is local. It gets bigger if you, if you cut out top-down inputs. The beta oscillations, which arise very abruptly after a few sniffs of an odor, linked to when the animal is, go is going to make his decision or her decision, um, now we know. Um, uh, these are uh, these engage the entire olfactory system, the entire limbic system where, where it has been recorded, and also parts of the motor system. So this indicates a, a real state change in the brain. And if we didn't look at the LFP, we wouldn't know this was happening. Now, we could say, okay, well, it's a good window. It's a good tool for the neuroscientist. Is it a good tool for the brain? And um, I think it is. The, the coordination, first of all, the, what it represents, the co coordination and very precise timing and the different states indicate that, um, that the timing of spikes arriving to other neurons is, is of course important. These fast changes are mediated by changes in small populations, or sorry, relatively large in the olfactory bulb populations of, neuro of small neurons um, that change state. They get hyper excitable and the whole brain changes state. So ignoring the LFP, actually, you would never solve the problem of what kinds of states the brain is entering in order to produce perception. Now, the faptic um, influences are very weak, but we all know that very weak forces across lots of neur neurons can produce a very strong effect. So probably they're strongest at the soma and in the dendritic tree because there's uh, less influence of myel in there. Um, so I'm, and we know we can't explain everything, with our current models, we're pretty good at explaining things, but I think aphapsis is actually a, a really interesting question. Eccles tried it um, to explain excitation inhibition at the synapse. He proved himself wrong, but that doesn't mean that the effect isn't there in other circumstances. Um, I think the other thing that we, that we all ignore, which terrifies me and keeps me up at night sometimes, is uh, our ignorance of what half the cells in the brain are doing that, particularly astrocytes at synapses, which are active. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Leslie. Uh, so what I would suggest now is that, I don't know if uh, Tony or Earl want to uh, get back to some of the issues that we've had in this first round and maybe highlighting some of the similarities and differences, perhaps along maybe two dimensions, right? Which is sort of that what we've been seeing here. One is 
Do we even need to discuss a little bit more about how to measure and the definition of FP? So we, we will almost leave that aside for now and actually just focus on what do they do and that scary word, the yeah. causal part, does it have causal powers? So if I could say um, a few words, I, I think nobody questions whether efaptic coupling can be real, is real. It's been experimentally documented. I think there are some, uh, some people have doubts about the magnitude of the effect. And I don't think that those, those questions are gonna be resolved here. Um, I think that they're real. I think that there are all sorts of things that we ignore in our first order discussions of how brains work. For example, um, when lots of neurons are active, there are uh, extracellular changes in potassium and other ions that affect neuronal excitability. There are extracellular changes in glutamate and um, GABA that we typically ignore. There are extracellular, there are, as um, Leslie pointed out, you know, astrocytes exert a huge effect. So there are all sorts of things that are going on beyond the simplest model that at least I walk around with in my head. And they're all real and they all can be important and they all can be studied and they're all interesting. But I think we're not here to sort of discuss all the things that can influence how neurons fire um, physically, at least that's not what drew me to this discussion, but rather the, I think, more interesting conceptual question of how we think about emergent um, phenomena. So I, I was going to also say that there is um, there's another sort of thing that we dance around, which is sometimes we use LFP to refer specifically to the summated electrical signal. And sometimes we use LFP to refer to some really interesting and real uh, facts about how large groups of neurons coordinate their activity or the fact that they tend to oscillate, right? They, there tend to be rhythms. So for example, you know, I think my training as a sensory physiologist made it very easy for me to ignore the importance of oscillations. Um, but now, you know, as, as I've looked more broadly and recently I've become more interested in motor systems. I mean, no one in a motor system who works in the motor system could possibly uh, ignore the functional importance of organizing neural activity into oscillations, right? There we know or at least feel like we have a very good idea about why groups of neurons are organized in, into oscillations. Because you, for example, when you're doing locomotion, you need the left and the right to move in a particular way, right? Those, that coordination is central to locomotion. In, fa in fact, might even, I would say probably is the evolutionary reason that um, oscillations became an organizing principle for a lot of uh, nervous system activities. So the fact that uh, groups of neurons are organized um, in the, into, well, into oscillations, their firing is into, uh, organized into oscillations is I think really important. I think, um, so I guess I'll, I'll just leave it there as a, as a way of trying to like separate out the ways we use different words. Like, are we talking about oscillations are we talking about LFPs as a way of measuring oscillations? Are we talking about the potential importance of oscillations? And if we are talking about oscillations, do we want to say that the oscillations are causal to locomotion at, in some way that's independent of the fact that the oscillations involve the activity of potentially thousands of neurons who are participating in slash causing the oscillations? That, that's, a, that's, I think, um, those are, that, that has to do with how we use words as yeah. much as what we think is going on. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, I would ahead. answer, oh, sorry. Um, I would ahead, answer Tony Please. with yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're using it in all those forms. And I don't think, you know, if we're gonna talk about causal, we have to talk about FAPSIS. We're not gonna do the experiment here, but we have to talk about the possibility because Otherwise, um, you're sort of trapped in a in a circle of the the LFP being the measure of the cooperative activity and the cooperative activity causing the LFP. Um, so so I mean, in that sense, 
if the, L the LFP is simply the measure of the cooperation. And the oscillations, yeah, you know, in a, in a, um, one of the early CNS meetings, uh, we had a workshop afterwards where Christian Linster and I came up with a, with a definition for oscillations is uh, uh, signals that go up and down. And so well, any fluctuating voltage, you know, can be spoken of uh, as an oscillation really. But I think that, um, that we have to talk about the FAPSIS in the conversation because then we have to think about geometry of cortex because cortex makes oscillations. Ganglia or makes good LFP, ganglia do not. If there is a FAPSIS, then that would suggest that cortex evolved not just for developmental um, organization, but also to somehow facilitate influence um, evolutionarily um, within cortical circuits to preserve coordinated activity better than you could in a ganglion. Because the, the field is going to only spread a certain distance, but the more uh, coordinated, you know, precise geometry you have, the bigger that field is going to be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as I said before we even started, I think there was a lot more convergence than we were converged a lot more uh, um, over the course of the Twitter discussion than we, we were at the start, which is a good thing. And I think we're seeing that now. But I'm going to, Tony's right about the um, terms. Are we referring to LFPs, referring to potentials, referring to electrical fields, or referring to, I'm going to avoid all that by just calling them brain waves. So we're talking about oscillating electrical fields. And think about it in terms of like what they can do. Think about it this way. Your brain is like the universe's largest orchestra and the neurons are the players. And you can, you're recording from, you know, billions of neurons, million, hundreds of millions of neurons are contributing to whatever's going on, the song. And you can record from 10 neurons, you record from 100 neurons, you record from 1,000 neurons, even a million neurons. And if you run the same trial 20 times in a row, you'll get 20 different patterns of neurons firing. That's a representational drift. So the individual players come and go, the neurons come and go, they drop in and out, but the song plays on. And that's what that larger level of organization is. It provides this overarching reinforcing structure that can keep the song going as these fickle players come and go. Dramitis Prinosis has some um, beautiful um, recent work on how you can actually add up the LFPs and spikes in the electrical fields and actually measure information at, at that level, and you get almost no representational drift. So for the same reason that the song can help the orchestra keep going, the electrical fields can reinforce what the structure of a, what an ongoing spiking activity in the brain, for the same reason it can reinforce that structure, you can also be used to change that, that structure. And I, I, you know, top down processing is all about flexibility, cognition is all about flexibility, and you have to organize your brain, organize processing your brain on the fly, moment to moment in response to what's going on right now. And, that's what resonance patterns are good for. They fall into resonance and they're stable until you push them somewhere else and they can fall into another resonance pattern. It's And given that uh, these are all like known laws of physics where electrical fields affect membrane potential, this is not like magic we're talking about here. It's just a pretty good way of doing things. And the, one, and the last thing I'll say for the moment is that what, really, what bothers me most is when people, the whole like title of this thing is that our LFPs epiphenomenal. Like I said, no one knows enough about the brain now to be calling things like this epiphenomenal. And the problem with it, using those kind of terms is that no one is saying our spikes epiphenomenal, they're saying our LFPs is epiphenomenal. So that's, that's paradigm defending. And my, my worry about it is that when you go around saying something like that, when there's, or, when there's organized meetings, our LFPs, our oscillations, rhythms, epiphenomenal, it kind of discourages people from, from studying them. Young people look, well, why should I bother to study something that other people are calling epiphenomenal? I really think it, it holds back the progress of science to be calling anything epiphenomenal right now, especially a, a signal that we're talking about that is that is not only, to my mind, not only plausible, but probable for, for causality. Okay, great. Uh, I think that that uh, sets the stage. I think if the three of you discussants are okay with the idea and then maybe we can bring start bringing in more uh, people for the discussion and there are 267 participants so let's see how this is going to go uh, we'll try our best uh, so we'll we'll, we'll we'll give it a try so uh, Sarah would you like to start uh, and asking your question or making um, making a comment and you sure. uh, please go ahead um, 
Yeah, I, I, I do know that calling things epiphenomenal is, is a just a dismissive way of, of putting things down and we should avoid this kind of language. But I, I'm a theorist, so this is my problem with LFPs. When somebody shows me a patch clamp experiment, I see the action potential. I know what the action potential is. When you put an electrode extracellularly and you catch activity, of course you catch activity, but what is this activity? So Earl kept on saying, is the loss of physics, but I would feel more comfortable discussing LFPs, whether they are oscillations or not, if there was some kind of generative model. If somebody could explain to me how a thousand or a million neurons um, uh, Leslie mentioned in the area, it's it's local, it's a certain yeah. distance. What is distance? I would like to have a physics model, if it is the loss of physics, of what generates the action potentials. And then I would feel more comfortable making an effort at understanding this signal if I knew what it was. Is it causing the, the states to go up and down, or is it the reflection of the fact that neural states are going up and down? So I, I feel that there is, I, I know that there was some discussion at the beginning, let's not go into what an, an LFP is, but without doing that, I think it's a little bit um, vague to discuss what is it that they do. Can, can I just answer that quickly? I, I There's a lot of good papers on, on that. And, and uh, Walter Freeman's 75 book, Mass Action in the Nervous System, goes into the physics of it in quite good detail. Um, so lots of neurons don't spike and they do like a ton of stuff. Um, so I, I would say that if, 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 you, if the spike is your only currency, then you're missing a lot of brain activity. Yeah. Can, can I can I weigh in on? Yeah, I want to weigh in. Go ahead, Tony. Then I'll I'll weigh in. Yeah. So, I, I think we do know the physics, and um, Christoph Koch and many other people have modeled it. That, but let me let me just say that I think there's a deeper thing that maybe Sarah's getting to, which is that um, although in general we know the laws of physics that give rise to the LFPs. In practice, we can't go in any, it's very hard to go in any particular case from the aggregate signal, which is the LFP, to the next layer down, which is how the LFP in this particular situation arose from the activity of the um, neurons that contributed to it. That for me personally is one of the, although I have recorded LFPs, I've studied them, I've published papers on them, they're incredibly useful. Um, nonetheless, I actually prefer, for example, the optical LFP, which is very similar to the electrical LFP, except it allows you to tease the optical, uh, the, the, the aggregate activity into the uh, activity of selected subsets of neurons. So for example, you can record, you can put calcium indicators into layer five neurons, right? And now you get to the aggregate activity of layer five neurons in a particular setting. And that potentially those, those neurons, their aggregate activity might tell you something different about what is going on in a particular setting than the aggregate activity of layer two, three neurons or PV neurons or the neurons that project from area X to area Y. So I think the LFP has historical significance because it was um, the first one, the, the, the first measure of aggregate activity that was accessible because for decades, all we had was electrical measurements. But I think that our goal of understanding emergent properties can also be served by other richer uh, complementary uh, measures of aggregate activity. Well, I personally would never argue against collecting more data. More data is always better than less data, and that includes not throwing out things like LFPs. But you're, the measures you're talking about sound very good, Tony. I was, I was going to make a general point here that I think we can be overly reductionistic. If we're overly reductionistic in how we study the brain, we hold back progress. We don't have to figure out 
everything before you figure out the next level. You got to study the brain in multiple levels simultaneously. And if we, you can take that reductionistic argument all the way down to, well, why bother to figure out molecules until you figure out quarks and vibrating strings? I mean, you, you, you got to do, let, study the brain all these different levels simultaneously and saying we can't, you know, I, I can't really make sense of LFP until I understand all the details of how they work. Well, that's a way that's, you know, if we wait to figure things out until we figure things out, we're never going to figure anything out. You know, so you got you got to carry things forward in all these levels. And there's enough work done on the level of LPs and especially the, at the functional level to say there's something really, really going on there and to ignore that or to dismiss that kind of work because we don't fully understand the LFP the way we understand the yeah, I, actual potentials is not to, it's, I think that's, that's, science is not about tradition of what you know, it's about pushing things forward. Yeah, but I, I, I think at least for me, I come from a cellular background and uh, connecting up the levels is useful because we know so much about the next level down. We know so much about individual neurons and pop, you know, neurons in, in um, how synapses work that it, it feels like it's a, it's a waste of all that potential uh, information to not leverage it when we go to the systems level. And at least for me, part of the draw is that but Tony, who's talking about not leveraging, leveraging it? it? No one is talking about not leveraging that, that information, that data. Sure, but, but that's why for me going down to the spike level is incredibly appealing and the synaptic level and um you know the the cell you, you know they exploiting different um uh, cell populations anyway yeah we need people studying things at the snaps level at the spike level and also other other but, levels too but you can't connecting say, what we my know level but no level. higher that's 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 just that's just uh, that's, just that's, one, that's, one second guys one second yeah. so i i wonder if uh, leslie um wanted to add something to the discussion that sarah initiated and 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 again and, and tony and earl were, were battling it out a little so do you have anything that um um could take this i think i think the for, <laughs> You know, I think there's information at all levels, um, but that's just you know, sort of why don't we all just get along? But um, but I I think that there is information at the level of the LFP that is not available if you're looking at single units. So, for instance, if you record a whole bunch of single units across the whole olfactory bulb and look at their average activity, you will not get a gamma oscillation because in each point of the olfactory bulb relative to another point at each burst in which a cell may fire once or twice, the phase relationship between those two points is random. So if you average over time and over space, you'll get just trash. If you look at the local field potential, what you will find is that there is highly organized oscillatory activity locally in each point and coherent across the entire bulb for each sniff. Wait, I'm sorry, just to clarify, are you saying that if you record all the neurons simultaneously in the bulb, you still can't get the... If, if, you, if you record all, say, all the mitral cells, or record one mitral cell at every, you know, glomerulus, let's, let's, let's be reasonable. Um, but, but no, with like calcium imaging, if you record all of them simultaneously right. or many. If you, if you say, okay, I'm going to get the LFP back by averaging all those events, you will not. If you recorded them simultaneously, you won't? You won't, unless you also include the LFP fluctuations in that signal at every point. If you, if you use only the neurons within a burst, because neurons fire very rarely within a burst, the, and because there's a random phase relationship for every sniff, although it's coherent within a sniff, right? So one burst, one sniff, and one neuron is going to fire once or twice during that during that burst, but the next sniff, the two points that you're averaging across have now a different phase relationship. So if you average all of those over time, you're going to get a flat signal. And we, we published this uh, in 2010, but it was just a replication of work that Walter had done years ago, because he basically has done everything. We're just repeating it. Um, and and. So without looking at the LFP, which gives you access to the coordinated activity at the moment, you're going to lose the moment. And the, the calcium, but, signal, but just, calcium yeah. signal, as far as I know, is not yet good enough to give you the kind of resolution you can get in the LFP. It's not fast enough. One thing. You're only going to get respiratory rhythm. You're not going to get gamma oscillations. 
I, I think that that's really the key point here. And so I think Tony, if you like, and in, in Earl, because uh, if you want to have like a one minute point or a rejoinder, please go ahead. But then afterwards, I'd like to extend a little bit more broadly to, to other members to discuss a little bit. I agree with Leslie. That was yeah, I, yeah I, I guess I would ask whether, so if you think that the issue is the temporal resolution of calcium, then perhaps what you're saying, but if what you're saying is that the um, population activity of spikes, or if you like the um, optical local field potential using, let's say a faster indicator, ind indicator, a voltage indicator, couldn't conceptually uh, recapture the local field potential, then I just don't understand how that can be given how our understanding of how brains work or of how neural signals propagate. But Tony, so, you're, talk, you're talking about thought experiments, not actual data. Like this is all no, no, scenarios but I, you're making up. Yeah, the, the no, signal's think, too slow. Yeah, the I, signal's too slow. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess for me, it's important to, the way I, I organize experiments is I think about what conceptually, you know, I, I develop a cartoon in my head. I ask what would be the perfect experiment if we could do it? And then as a separate question, I ask, given the tools we have right now, what is the experiment I can do? But it's for me, it's really important to separate out, you know, the underlying cartoon model of what's going on versus how our measurements um, distort that cartoon or sample that cartoon, which inevitably is how it goes. But th I, maybe that's not a universal way of approaching uh, scientific problems. Okay, great. Um, Leslie, unless you have a quick point to add, uh, let's just broaden it up a little bit. And I think uh, the next. Um, a comment or question is from Kevin, Kevin Mitchell. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, really interesting discussion. Um, but it feels like there's a couple different things that are being maybe conflated a bit. I, I think it's, it's obvious that there are population level dynamics at play in the brain that are super important for information coding and controlling behavior and, and so on. And that includes things like, um, Entrainment and oscillations and so on. Is that is that coming from me? Some, that I think there's from some me? mics open. I don't know if, uh, where it's coming from. If you have a okay. mic open, it's I coming from someone named Reindeer Dorman. There, it's muted. Mute them. Mute them. Okay, I, I just muted. Um, okay. So, so the question, I guess, is whether um, you need to have these local sort of field potential extracellular mechanisms biophysically at play in a system in order to get those dynamics. And I guess that's an open question, but it doesn't seem to me like a priori you would need to in that you can get dynamics from a, from a network with different kinetics and, and so on, and you add some you know, top-down neuromodulatory signals or bottom-up attention or arousal or whatever, and um, and, and you get different population dynamics, excuse me, that's really important for what the system's doing. But the question is whether the LFP itself as a biophysical mechanism is part of that. And, and I guess, Earl, from what you've said, it, you, you just seem to take it as a sort of so plausible that it would be that it just makes sense to you as a, as a top-down mechanism. And I, I guess I just don't see it as a necessity. I see it as a possibility but one that is empirically open. And I guess one thought experiment would be to take your network of synaptically connected neurons and disperse them at a spatial distance such that no LFP physically arises and see if you get the same dynamics. And I, my feeling is that in a, in a lot of the you know, simulations you could do in silico, you would absolutely get all kinds of interesting dynamics where uh, an LFP just wouldn't physically arise. But those those dynamics, I mean, it's not how the brain works. I mean, we're talking about not how, in principle, what neurons could do if you put them in a very artificial configuration. We're talking about how the brain actually actually works. And I think Leslie should speak more about this because she, and as she pointed out, you know, not all the neurons in the in the brain spike, and there's a lot of things going on at that level that are contributing to brain function that had little to do with, or little to do with it above and beyond spiking spiking alone. But I think, you know, I've heard this in the, in the Twitter thing. Well, you don't need LFPs to make the neuromuscular junction work. Oh, if you put three neurons in a dish, they can influence one another with spiking and you don't need LFPs. Well, we're not trying to figure out the neuromuscular junction in three neurons in a dish. We're trying to figure out peace, love, and understanding, how the brain works as a whole. And that's where these 
properties are going to make make a difference. And you can you can come up with thought experiments or contrived situations where LFPs won't matter, but that's not what the brain is doing. But but Earl, it feels like that's just an assertion, right? I mean, it, it the question is empirically, how could we tell the difference? It seems there's two yeah. possibilities: either you get emergent dynamics from the synaptic connectivity itself, or LFPs themselves are doing some work and. Uh, what I'm looking for beyond an assertion that it should be that way is okay. some evidence that it actually is that way. Well, you know, this is a, this, 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 this is a two way street, though. So there's two ways this goes. What's the evidence that spiking is, is doing it all? There's no causal evidence that spikes are doing everything in the brain. Why are we asking more of the LFP model yeah. than we're willing to accept for the spiking model? Yeah, Kevin, I was going to say that you, you're claiming that Earl is, is making an assumption, but so are you. You're just asking well, him on the other way sure. around to show it. So well, I, mean, I, again, I, think I think he's, he's asking a good question, though. I think he's asking. Oh, it is an excellent question. question. Yeah, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, and and I, think, I think that it's time to think about modeling what we would predict. It, I mean, Eccles did it in 1945 and 1947. We, we should be able to come up with a model of of how the faptic interactions, how much influence they should have and be able to make some predictions about the influence in different you know, geometries of cortex. I mean, it, it might be simple. Okay. One, one, Can quick, I just... one quick example of, um, of that is from Michael Lundquist's work on working memory. He built a working memory model from biophysics on up and the oscillations were an emergent property. He didn't build them into the model and that's how the model works. It's all from e EPSB, IPSB, it's all from known bio biophysics and the, the, the yeah, yeah. were an emergent property of that. Can I just that's say that point, we can, Earl. Can, you can get can, oscillations just just from the synaptic connectivity. Exactly. Sorry, Tony, so, jump back in. Yeah, no, no, but I, I think that we, we have you know, an experiment that goes like a, an experiment that happens all the time, which is if you dump certain neurotransmitters onto the cortical circuit, they either do or they either uh, increase their oscillations or the oscillations go away. To me, that indicates that the oscillations are highly susceptible to the things that neuro, uh, neuromodulators influence, namely uh, individual cellular properties, as well as synaptic coupling. And in fact, you can, you can, um, Pick neuromodulators that primarily affect the synaptic coupling. So to me, what that argues is that what the uh, nervous system needs is a dynamical way of controlling the degree of oscillation. And that degree of oscillation, the, the degree of oscillation mediated coupling between regions, for example, is uh, to my mind, largely synaptic, right? Now, the, 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 the brain has to deal with the fact that it is physical matter and there are these uh, couplings, we can argue about whether they're small or big, but ultimately the brain sometimes needs coupling between certain areas and sometimes doesn't. And the control, since you can't move neurons around, the way that coupling is established is by manipulating the synaptic and uh, coupling and single cell properties. So yeah, see, but yeah, we're arguing the opposite. We're arguing that then you can actually influence it at that LFP level because it's influencing membrane potentials. And at that level, you can actually influence neural excitability on, on a large scale level. I don't see how you can organize a complex intelligent brain where you gotta, gotta, gotta somehow control every single synapse or every single uh, connection yeah. between neurons. The, the, this, 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 this large scale, at, the, at this, this level of brainwave, this large scale, coordination of excitability is a pretty good way to, to or organize the brain. And um, just because we are thinking came from a um, spike heavy um, uh, history doesn't mean that's the only thing that's going on. Okay, excellent. Um, Mitra, I thought you had a question. You, you, you don't wanna need to have a question anymore or you would like to ask a question? It, it, it was sort of addressed by some of the previous comments, but I just wanna clarify okay. first whether um, do all the panelists agree that if you ch if you had if you do the thought of experiment of having neurons with a particular set of activity and you alter the spatial arrangements of those neurons, then the low frequency signal that you'll measure it will be completely different. Everybody agrees I agree. with that, yeah. right? But I also agree if you take apart the brain, it will no longer work. Sorry, if you take apart the brain, what? It'll no longer work. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so then, to what extent does this discussion about whether uh, low frequency 
activity in the brain matters to neural function, in some ways reduced to the argument about whether the spatial arrangement of neurons in the brain matters. I mean, of course, there's all sorts of reasons for neurons to be spatially arranged in the way that they are. And the generation of LFPs is one either result of this or, um, or, a, uh, or a cause of that spatial arrangement. I'm seeing in the chat that somebody's saying it's not a sensible experiment. I, I, think, I think it is. I think if, it is. <laughs> of course, it's a it's a thought experiment. You're you're wondering like to what extent does this yeah. low frequency activity have an impact independent? Yeah. No, I think that's a great question, Mitra. Because I mean, on the one hand, I would say yes, the LFP would disappear if you if you say turned piriform cortex into something like the uh, amygdala or the or the striatum. Right. If you disorganize the neurons, you wouldn't get a strong LFP. Now, if LFP is not um, causal as a, a you know a faptic or other type of force, then then that shouldn't matter for processing. We just wouldn't be able to see it. If it is causal, then then that would um, disrupt function. And you know there are brain disorders. We don't know what causes it, but that are characterized by disrupted cortical geometry. Um, uh, and so maybe that is, maybe that's an experiment we can actually do, or at least do some correlative measures to see if the level of disorganization in, in these mouse models that they have duplicated um, disorganization leads to changes in LFP that correlates with changes in function. Great question. Okay, uh, Mitra, you wanted to follow up anything or is that uh... okay? So I think uh, I think the, the next question is from Demetrius. Um, if you if it possible, if you can turn on your camera, that'll be great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So uh, so let's say that another thought experiment. Say that we record from an area and we see spikes in LFP. We get all the information. And we want to know what does what can we say given the LFP. So if we could turn off only the voltage gated sodium channels and prevent all the spikes just locally, only there in the area that we record, do you guys think that we could see a different LFP, the same LFP, largely the same, but somewhat different, maybe in some frequencies? And given given the answer to these questions. What could we really tell about the the LF, that the LFP represents? Okay, who wants to go? Well, that argues for that that there's somehow some independence between the spikes and the LFPs, and that's just not yeah. true. I mean, they 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 mutually influence one another. And so I think the kind of experiments where let, let's get rid of spikes and see what LFPs do alone. LFPs don't do it alone. They do it. No, no one is arguing that spikes aren't important. No one is arguing that LFPs do the same thing that spikes are doing. No one is arguing that LFPs do computa computation. Actually, Terry Sanowski has argued that LFPs do computation. I'll leave that aside for a moment. But what the what the general premise we're asking here is that that it, we're going with here is that these brain waves are the organization of spiking. So spiking is still central, just a good way to organize right. it. So to so I. My problem with I mean, thought experiments are fun to think about, but they don't really give us anything practical to work with because the kind of scenarios we come up with are things that that just take the brain out of operating mode. No, no. so um, we can envision. So the LFP. So again, we're using LFP to mean two things. We could be using LFP to mean oscillations, i.e. Um, you know, the aggregate, uh, some kind of global organization between the aggregate activity of a bunch of neurons, or we could specifically mean the thing we measure at the tip of our electrode, which is one of many aggregated activities we could measure, okay? So we can do an experiment where we scramble the positions of neurons, and nature does that sometimes for us by changing the geometry of a structure, and we could ask what would happen if the um, positions of the neurons were different, giving rise to different LFPs, and yet the spikes were the same. So given 
the, the set of spikes, we could potentially have many different sets of LFPs depending on uh, how those, um, those neurons were organized in space. However, there are other ways of measuring aggregate activity. And this is what I keep going back to. We can measure the aggregate activity of all neurons that are in some layer, of all neurons that express some marker, of all inhibitory neurons, all excitatory neurons. All of those are potentially, and not just potentially, people have measured all those things and they're all incredibly interesting and valuable ways of measuring aggregate, aggregate activity. And to your point, Earl, our, my, our goal, I think, is to understand how the collections of neurons give rise to computation. You're right, it's not just a bunch of neurons twinkling in the star, like stars. They, they are organized and correlated in interesting ways that give rise to computation. And the LFP is just one of an infinite number of ways of sampling it that is privileged for historical reasons. Sure, but no one is arguing that we shouldn't measure other things too. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the th thing we kept coming back to on Twitter. People saying, oh, you, th we, you don't think spikes are important or you think spikes are doing, this, LFP is doing the same thing as spikes. No one is saying that. No one's saying, I'm the last person who will say we should, we should throw away um, signals. Collect it all, everything's. I, I, Do I don't you think, think there's something privileged about the aggregate activity that you measure from an LFP versus yeah. any of these other aggregate activities? That's for me the question. Is there yeah. something privileged about that one? I'm not or is it a historical artifact of how the history of, in the history of neuroscience, we learned to measure things? Well, spiking being number one is a historical accident in neuroscience Absolutely. too, because for a long time it was the only thing that we could measure because we had single electrodes. So let's not, let's not lose sight of that. Wait, wait, Absolutely. Wait, 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 wait. I'm You're saying all these aggregate <laughs> signals are, are good to look at. I'm looking at the immersion properties. That's the whole thing. That's why I keep sidestepping LP dicing by saying brain waves. The brain is, if the brain doesn't have emergent properties, I don't know what does. And aggregate activity is a pre pretty good way to measure it. And if the argument is that, you know, it's uh, all this, just this one signal and nothing else, I don't, I, I don't see that as productive. And, and some of these thought experiments, I mean, they're interesting to think about, but any time, any of these changing the geometry, of the area, if you change the geometry of the brain, the brain's not going to work the way it did, did before. So I'm not sure what that gets us. Well, well, you can change, you can, I mean, the same way we do all kinds of experiments, you can change it in a known way and measure, you know, measure how it changes and measure how that change correlates with changes in, in function. And, you know, that's what we do. Press it from multiple, multiple levels. Yeah. And so, yes, or disorganizing the cortex, I think is a really good experiment. Uh, I, some of those I would like, but I would like to see, but, but. You know, first I want to push back. Yes, people recorded single neurons before they could record lots of neurons, but before that, people were recording LFPs for decades. So, True. Um, in behaving animals, so um, uh, there's, you know, you have to do the homework. You have to find out for each cortical area what that that signal represents and what changes in that signal represent. You can't just say, oh. LFP is LFP, oscillations are oscillations, gamma is gamma, it's different everywhere. And so, you know, this is why I was advocating a little tongue in cheek, but for real, on olfactory bulb and probably hippocampus are the two areas where the most work has been done to understand what, you know, singles, what groups of cells, what synapses, what neurotransmitters give rise to different um, oscillatory states and LFP markers. And so I think that looking at it from that level, if you dissect the circuit enough, you can absolutely do this, what, these thought experiments, you know, versions of them and, and figure out if it's causing something. Right. You know, there are a lot of experiments showing that if you, if you um, rhythmically stimulate the brain, you can, act, you can actually change function, improve function even. I mean, screwing up the brain is really easy, but improving the brain is, is more well, difficult. Rhythmically stimulating, I mean, we do that with electroshock too, but, um, but, well, I, mean, look, I mean, rhythmic no, stimulation when, versus the arrhythmic stimulation. When, when EEG was first invented, I mean, there was this whole cottage industry of feeding EEG into other people's brains, you know, to, re to transfer knowledge and read thoughts. And that's clearly bullshit. But, um, well, <laughs> but it's not a good example, you know, but okay. Can, <laughs> yeah. can we, People thought of crazy things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, but can that kind of influence have an effect on the circuit? I think so. Well, a absent making neurons spike. I mean, if you could have this influence without making neurons spike, then then I think you're a little closer to to 
a real effect. But see, that's, that's kind of my point is that if there's people cite these, uh, uh, you know, um, stimulation studies as an example of single of spiking being being the whole thing. But whenever you pump a signal into the brain, you're changing the LFPs, you're changing the dynamics, you're changing electrical fields too. So there's really no experiments that show spikes alone do it all. So she would, we shouldn't expect, we shouldn't hold LFPs to, or, or electrical fields or brain waves to that standard because spiking doesn't meet that standard either. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. We don't have causality in the brain is, is uh, difficult to interpret. And we don't have causal experiments for spiking alone, just like we don't have causal experiments for LFPs alone. That one you influence one you you influence the other, but there are examples like we did this study with uh, Alec Widge, who was a um, fellow at MGH, where if you use closed loop stimulation to enhance theta rhythms in the internal capsule, human patients get better at a get better, not worse, get better at a, at a, at, a, at a cognitive test. So and the arrhythmic stimulation did nothing. Now we maybe that circles back to whether what's causing what, but still we could say that something is happening at this organizational um, 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 you know, level that that's that's having a real effect on function. Okay, let's let's take a think. Let's take one more question, uh, Matt. I uh, don't know if you can turn the camera on, but uh, you're next. So I was going to ask Tony the question he raised himself, um, which is, isn't it? Um, so so there are lots of signals you could measure, but isn't the aggregate electrical activity kind of privileged in that it's the only one which is causal? So the, there's not an obvious way to my mind that neurons could read out, say, the aggregate activity of some molecularly defined cell type all by themselves, whereas the aggregate electric field does polarize polarizable membranes, which is the whole way the brain works. Okay, I, I personally don't think that um, even, so I, I do believe that if aptic uh, coupling can occur. Um, we can quibble about its size. I, it just occurred to me that we could actually measure it rigorously in the cortex, for example, by blocking all the synaptic channels within a given cell and recording from that postsynaptic cell. Uh, so now it receives zero synaptic coupling. And we could see just how big the field oscillations in vivo during uh, oscillations are for that neuron. And that would that would actually tell us that they might be quarter of a millivolt, they might be 10 millivolts. My guess is they're closer to quarter than 10, but it is what it is. Um, to my mind, regardless of what the size of those oscillations is, my belief, which I guess is informed by spending lots of years studying artificial neural networks, is that computation actually requires um, a fair amount of subtlety. It, it requires a fair amount of richness in the way that neurons interact. And so if they were to only interact through um, these very large changes that weren't dynamically controllable by synaptic by changing synaptic activity, then it's I actually, for me, I think this deep down is why I am skeptical that we should stop at the level of the LFPs. We should acknowledge, in my view, that these oscillations occur and they may play an important role. Um, but that's just, it, it's almost like looking at the, the first eigenvalue of a very, very long and rich decomposition. And obviously the largest eigenvalue is indeed a powerful one. It's often an oscillatory one, but without the rest of it, uh, you're not gonna have rich computation. And I guess that's, that's sort of how I view it. Tony, two things. One, no one is arguing that LFPs or rhythms or brainwaves do everything. No one's arguing. I keep saying spikes are really, 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 really important. Yeah. No one is saying spikes are important. And I'm not sure you and I disagree very much, except about how we use words. Yeah, and but the other thing is that your example of like, well, we'll measure LFP of one neuron and see what effects has next neuron. That's great if you want to figure out how two neurons communicate. But the brain no, 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 is no, not that wasn't two, the two, no, two no, neurons. No, no, it's actually, a gazillion neurons all all packed no, in no, together. No, no, no. The, the experiment was you 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 decouple one neuron synaptically from the rest of the circuit in the brain in vivo while there's oscillations going on, and then you could use that and separate out the synaptic contribution to that neuron. That one neuron. Well, that one neuron, we could do it for 50 yeah, neurons but, one at a time. But the, the point ways, is we're not perturbing the system. Well, you should do that. The, the ways of isolating it, though, Tony, are going to 
prohibit your seeing because because blocking the synaptic activity is going to no um, no not not in the circuit just postsynaptically in a single neuron right right but blocking that is going to well i guess it would no, 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 i guess I, mean, have a, yeah, I really i have a really naive question for someone who doesn't know the, the wait, so, so physics there can't it can't there people be interaction what's that so, there were two things going on at once. I didn't yeah, so uh, let me, Matt, let me just ask one quick, quick question. So, from the point of view of someone naive about the biophysics, there, when you say when you when you decoupling there, you you're assuming the contributions are completely linear. Can there be some some scenario? I mean, again, it's completely a naive question, possibly, in which you need you need both to have an uh, to have the effect of the oscillatory component. Yeah. But in that case, well, that doesn't mean yeah. that it's, you know, yeah. it's not an additive. It's not an additive. No, no. So you see what I mean? So, no, I mean, uh, currents. All right. What, I, the, like in Hodgkin Huxley, right? We have currents and the size of the current depends itself or the size of the conductance depends on the voltage. That should not be the case in there. There should be, there's no reason for there to be a nonlinearity that's dependent on, synap on synapses or a strong nonlinearity that depends on synapses for a particular. Look, I, I think we, we're, at, we're way over the end of our time. I could, I could flesh out this biophysical experiment. It's actually fun to me that it's actually a doable experiment, but I think maybe in our closing seconds, we should, think, um, we should, we should maybe back up to larger, larger issues. I think versions of this Matt was saying have been done. Um, and I'm not, I don't, given that the tools that I'm proposing to do this for have only become available in the last like five years, I don't think this experiment has been done. Yeah, but you're going to, you're going to block ion channels in some cases as well. So you'd have to. No, block. you needn't. The, no, that's the point. You could, you could express an intracellular virus that cleaves uh, glutamate and GABA channels and shuts down synaptic transmission in that cell without affecting other, any other cell or the ion channels in it. I, it it's, yeah. it's a lot of work and I'm not sure it would teach Yeah, I think, you should, I think you should do this experiment and get back to us, then we'll know. Uh, Matt, do, Matt, do you want to do you want to follow up? You were in the middle of something and kind of yeah. So, so I have one sort of quick point and one bigger point. So um, Warren Grill's group has done sort of a computational version of this, right? So if you imagine the lower bound is just a passive neuron, you can solve all of this just sort of finite element or biophysically, and there are you know decent size effects. But I think the bigger question that I wanted the other question I wanted to follow up with is. Um, several people keep talking about the necessity of this. Like, is it needed? You know, it, it's going to be the first eigenvalue. It's kind of, kind oh. of useless. Um, but in my view, anything you make the neuron do is going to change the extracellular environment. So isn't this more inevitable? Like, it's not that you need it. It's that you can't avoid it. And given that yeah. it's there, what does it do? It's inevitable yeah. in, in the same way that changes in extracellular potassium are inevitable. And it changes in extracellular glute. Like, when cells are firing, the extracellular glutamate level goes way up, right? And we are, and yet that doesn't have this sort of, we, we're not, we haven't organized a special panel on the influence of extracellular glutamate fluctuations on neural activity. But see, that's right? my Why whole not? problem is that we're asking questions about the epiphenomenon of, of this thing, which doesn't, doesn't fit in it, everybody's models. It, it's not an epiphenomenon. It's the, to my mind, it's not an epic, it's a real phenomenon. The question is, um, in understanding how collections of neurons compute, is it the central thing that the nervous system, that central knob that it, it, it has under its control that uh, it enables a network to achieve the computation that it would like to uh, achieve? I think it's a knob. Spiking is very important. This is a good way to organize spiking. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to shift things along a little bit here, Gualtiero, do you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question? Thanks. Um, and thanks for the great discussion. Uh, I wanted to ask if I understand the, the, the scope of the debate correctly. Everybody seems to agree that large scale um, synchronized oscillations play a role in computation behavior. Um, Everybody agrees that there's these electrical um, 
signals that can propagate locally extracellularly. And it seems to me that the main dispute is whether that these like extracellular uh, electrical signals between neurons and localized that could be captured in, in aggregate form by these uh, local field potentials, whether they play any role at all in neural computation and in, in, in neural in, in functional activity. And, and if they do, how significant that is, you know, is it is it a minuscule, almost, you know, uh, negligible role, or is it a significant role in addition to the standard synaptic transmissions that everybody also agrees is 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 certainly super important and and critical to cognition? Am I right in understanding this is the scope of the debate? I, I believe so, but let's yeah. see the panel answer. I, I, I think heard. I think it is, and I and, and I think again, my problem is even asking the question because no one would say, "Oh, is glutamate impo important for brain function? Is potassium important for brain function? Is spiking important for brain function?" We're asking that. We're asking, well, these oscillations are are they important? There's a lot of evidence to think that they are, and I think just by asking the question, it's it, it's it's dismissing because we're not asking the same questions of other things that we all accept. So why are we asking? We're, at, we're setting a higher bar for this one particular aspect of brain function that we know we other models don't meet that bar either. So, you know, we we, we can't be in the process. We can't be put ourselves in the position of defending what we think we know and asking other people's models to achieve a higher um, threshold for credibility than our own models do. I think we should I think it, reach, they should all reach that threshold. Yeah, um, I, so, yeah. I think it. I think it almost summarizes it for me. I guess I remain, I can, I remain a little frustrated because I think we're still not using words in ways that I can understand because we conflate, um, I believe, the causal role, the effect, the potential effactic role from the um, potential of these thing of these LFPs to um, be a convenient measure of aggregate activity. I think that they're both potentially interesting and important, but I think it's very difficult for me to understand what people are saying unless we separate out those two particular roles. And I, I still don't see them being consistently distinguished. Yeah, um, so I, yep. I, I, I agree with Tony, but I actually, I wanna push back with, with Earl's comment um, that, uh, well, what I, I try to say to myself, is this signal important for the brain or is it important for the neuroscientist? And usually the signals that we talk about are important for the neuroscientist and, and our inferences about what the brain is doing. Spikes or LFPs, I True think we have to ask, are those signals themselves important for the brain? And maybe neither of them are, maybe both of them are, but you know, a spike is, is an is a measure of when a neuron reaches what Adrian found in 19 what 13 or whatever, you know, the all or none state and releases a blob of neurotransmitter. Um, that's what we're measuring. It's not the spike, it's not the voltage. We're measuring the neuron state. I, I completely so, so agree. I would say for, yeah. for both of those, those are signals that are, are useful to neuroscience. Yeah. As do I. The further question is whether that voltage has an effect beyond the measurement. And I, I, I'm, Earl is convincing me, but I am firmly in favor of some experiments that might, um, or models that would measure how big the effect should be. Yeah, well, that's what we're all doing, doing experiments. That's why we're, we're all here. And I agree with everything you just said, Leslie. These are, all these signals are important, so we should treat, treat them all as important. We shouldn't be dismissing some, some signals. We should, we should favor, never dismiss favoring anything. Others. We I, shouldn't I dismiss anything. Of, exactly, Tony. Exactly. I think so, the point of this is not to dismiss them, but to, for me, what would be helpful is to understand the relationship between the different signals that we're measuring. That's what I'm trying to clarify here. And if we disagree about the relationship, that's also useful. But at this point, I still can't fully understand if we even disagree about the relationship because I can't find 
a consistent use of these words and terms Tony, that map onto the things I understand. Yeah, Tony, let me sounding like Jordan Peterson a little. Uh, Tony, let me Tony, let me just add one thing uh, actually that just keeps occurring to me, which is the way you put it. it in fact, it to me it 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 forces us to either build this computational or mathematically so that we have something that is clear and formal enough that we can actually essentially instantiate these words that we seem to be disagreeing in, in a computational mathematical manner. Because otherwise, you know, it's like, oh, I mean, maybe Earl is interpreting it slightly this way and I don't and whatnot. So I think that's the value of, of computation, as we all know, that's the value of some kind of computational or mathematical formalism, obviously tied to experiments as well. But I, it seems that that would be the only way to go forward and, 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 and make this sufficiently precise so that we can disentangle some of these claims. And I think that that would be my take, at least, is, is, is looking at this debate, is that it seems to really be crying for, for more mathematical rigor. I mean, obviously, this I'm sure this exists, and I'm just being being uh i'm not informed enough but i, I think that in, in a way that actually helps the debate make make some clarify some of these issues there are a couple of questions that i wanted to make sure that i could go could go and uh, and and get them um, before we break but uh balint balant uh do you want to ask a question hello uh yeah my name is balant uh, and actually, I would like to just have a remark on uh, because it it was the case that we call uh, LFP as an aggregate measure, which I think is true, but it's not the full truth. And it's a very important thing uh, that in in a sense, LFP has a higher resolution than a spike because it reflects a lot of processes that are going on in the dendrites uh, or, or, or on a synaptic level. So in a, in a sense, it's an aggregate measure across many cells. And in another sense, it, is, it has a higher resolution than if you would, if you would record from, from spikes. So in that sense, I think it's not necessarily the best way to kind of put put the, the, the optical LFP against the electrically recorded extracellular LFP against each other, because they measure different things to some extent. So we, I think we learn more by recording LFP than by recording just an optical signal or recording just the spikes. I don't know if Tony wants to say something or Earl, anyone? Well, I would say that I think this is basically comes down to my philosophy is that we measure every signal we can, we do as many experiments as we can, and we don't frame our questions or debates on ways that dismiss some signals or favor some signals over others. More data is always better than less data. I would just add to that that you can't just use the signal, you have to know what the cells are that are producing different parts of the signal and which synapses. Yeah, I think right. I know how. how um, how Earl will respond to this comment, but but uh, Tony pointed out that there are two different definitions kicking around here for LFP, and I guess I would suggest we just accept both of them, Tony. Um, you can split it apart if you want. You can say, okay, we'll have a local field potential as we'd record from a you know two two mega ohm electrode uh, in layer four, or we can say we're going to look at oscillations globally across the whole cortex. I don't care, frankly. I think the LFP as formally defined is more the former than the latter, but um, take both. And I think Earl's point is that the causality percolates every goddamn which way. You simply cannot control it. You're gonna get causality from the oscillations built, working down to the synapse. You're gonna get cause, causality from, from efaptic processes from gap junctions turning on and off or popping in and out. Um, so the causality that you're looking for, Tony, I respect it, I understand it, and I've worked from the bottom up too, but I think we just have to accept the causality runs every which way. I guess I, I, I gotta say, I, I think it does, but as an experimentalist, trying to understand how 
brain circuits give rise to computation. Um, we nowadays have an incredibly rich collection of tools for manipulating all aspects of the circuit. Uh, they're not enough, but they're really powerful. If we wanted, if we had hypotheses about the role of short-term synaptic plasticity in a behavior, which I do, we have tools for manipulating that, for turning off um, inputs from different subsets of neurons. And the thing is that I think those are precisely, those knobs are the ones that nature gets to twiddle easily, right? It's much harder for nature to twiddle the um, organization of the cortex, to do a massive reorganization of the physical layout of neurons that would give rise to a very different coupling of EFAPSIS. So when nature does, de evolves a circuit that let's say allows us in one part of the cortex to process vision and in another part of the cortex allows us to process um, audition and in a third part um, it, uh, instantiates working memory. Those, how it does those three different things with very similar looking circuits, that's what I find super exciting. And the knobs that nature has for that, for the most part, the biggest, the, the, the knob that it can twiddle the most is which neuron is connected to which neuron and what are the properties of those connections and of the individual neuron. So for me, like the exciting thing is to understand um, how those computations occur. And that, that's why I am particularly excited about focusing on other things. I should just say at this point that I have never said that uh, LFPs are an epiphenomenon because I don't know what that term means. And as I keep saying, I'm also excited about recording LFPs, which I've done multiple times and I think is you know, a really useful and powerful signal to get me started into understanding the aggregate activity of neurons. Um, so, you know, I may, maybe there are other people who use that term epiphenomenon, but it's never been me. Yeah. And it was I, in the title of our, uh, it was in the to, title of this. Uh... Yeah, I, I, but I never used it. I, I think it was a provocative title. It, it's my it fault. Oh, well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> so, um, just, just a, a comment to follow that up, Tony. Um, I, I think that, you know, it depends on your question of the brain, right? The kinds of questions I ask are about perception and about system-wide states. And so these are things you cannot measure at the single unit level. Um, you could conceivably with a whole lot of work and unlimited amounts of money, but you know, with a 50 cent electrode, well, now they're $2 because the connectors are more expensive. But um, you know, I can tell you, a sequence of brain reliable brain states that are part of a perceptual and motor act. Um, and so it really, it, it depends entirely on the kind of question you're asking, what kind of method is gonna be best for answering that. And so I, you know, I, I don't think that LFP, you know, is a course measure of what the brain is actually doing. I think it's, as Pauline uh, pointed out, I think in many cases, it's a better measure. Um, of what the brain is doing, but it depends on the question. And I, yeah, I, and I would follow, Tony, just, Tony, let me just follow up what ahead. you were saying too, and that is, um, you know, no one is saying that the connect, exact connectivity between, between um, neurons isn't important. No one is saying that the speaking that the travel on weighted synapses is, is not important. But the way we're thinking about now is anatomy is like the road and highway system. It says where traffic in the brain could flow. And what your thoughts are where traffic does flow from moment to moment and these kind of patterns of uh of uh, um excitability are ways of helping direct the traffic along the road and highway system but no one is saying the road and highway system isn't important it's not one or the other it's it's a way of taking all these connectivity you're talking about just doing important things and orchestrating them in ways that are, are flexible and that's what cognition is all about flexibility but no one is yeah, dismissing I, the uh connectivity sure, and saying sure. it's not important Sure. I, I just back to Leslie's point. I, I, I agree that if I had a choice between one single unit electrode and an LFP, I might often choose the LFP. Um, these days in my lab and many other labs, the choice is um, not that, but for example, the recording of uh, hundreds or thousands of single neurons at once using either, you know, neuropixel probes or calcium imaging, um, or another choice is to use other aggregate measures 
of activities such as the optical local field potential or wide field imaging or um, I, uh, I, would, and, I would and, say in many cases, I mean, all methods are biased, um, that there absolutely. are biases yep. you know, to recording hundreds of single units, depending on where your electrodes are and which neurons you happen to pay attention to. Um, and there, you know, the calcium signal we've already talked about has biases in its temporal resolution. Um, and what you can see, you know, in imaging from the surface of the brain. So I, I, you know, I think that I, I actually would choose the 50 cent local field potential or the $2.50 local field potential for the questions I want to ask if I had to choose one. All right, so it's it's already uh, th almost 30 past the hour. I don't know if the dis discussants still have some energy. Uh, if you do, we can have a few more questions. I see Kevin has a question there, uh, but I don't also don't want to impose on your time uh, too much. Uh, it's more than we already spent the time here. So should we go for- I'm already half hour late to my noon meeting, so. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So Kevin, that's your cue. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so one thing we haven't sort of discussed much is an evolutionary perspective here, because I think a lot of the discussions have been around vertebrate systems and the cortex and olfactory bulb and so on, where there's lots and lots of neurons at play. And, and presumably if LFPs are a mechanism um, that, that animals use in the nervous system, that must have evolved with some level of complexity. And you can imagine that they you know, aren't present, for example, in a, in a hydra that has a diffuse nerve net because the neurons are just not close enough together, maybe, I, I don't know. But maybe when you put things into a ganglion, like uh, the head ganglion of a C. elegans, maybe LFPs start to arise. Maybe they're a nuisance. I mean, you know, maybe they have to be controlled for. Maybe they actually interfere with uh, the, the sort of spiking connectivity from one neuron to another. Uh, but maybe also because they exist, uh, nature, uh, you know, learn to take advantage of them in, in larger nervous systems. So I, I wonder if, I know there's some stuff in, you know, grasshopper olfactory bulb that Gilles Laurent has done, for example, but I wonder if there's any evolutionary perspective on this as a mechanism that, that emerged that either has to be taken account of and corrected for in some way, or that can be taken advantage of in, in larger nervous systems. Well, I think to answer that, you'd have to, um, uh, you'd ha also have to look at, uh, you know, when, when cortical organization evolved, when myelination evolved. Um, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I know the Laurent lab stuff pretty well. Um, the, the, you don't get an LFB in the antenna lobe. Um, you get, you pick it up at the synaptic terminals you know, in the mushroom body or where, wherever um, they project because it's a disorganized neural pill. Um, so I would say, you know, maybe because, you know, there's also, these are not myelinated neurons, maybe it's important to not organize them, but given that, you know, cortex and geometry kind of evolved later, I, I, would, I would guess, I don't have proof, but I would guess that in those small systems, either it's a big effect or it's no effect at all. And, and maybe it's in those, maybe it's in those small systems that we could actually measure it, right? And then make some predictions about cortical systems. This isn't much of an answer, but but um, you know, the whole universe vibrates and your brain your, your rhythmically, and your brain is rhythmic if nothing else. I mean, it's the first signal we record from the brain. Evolution uses whatever's in the room. It's hard for me to believe that evolution wouldn't take advantage of this ability of oscillating signals to self-organize and create a brain that needs to be self-organized. I mean, I just hard for me to imagine that evolution said, oh, here's this great oscillatory uh, signal that's self-organizing. I'm just going to ignore it and do my thing with just, just connectivity alone. I just can't imagine the brain evolved that way. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, some... I, I agree with you, Earl, because you know, the, in fact, the antenna lobe in particular evolved completely separately from the olfactory bulb. The glomerular uh, structure and everything evolved four different times. So I, I, it yeah, says I, to I, me I, that something, you know, is important about how this circuit is built. Even if you can't yeah, I, measure I, the LFP, it's oscillating. So well, that LFP is built on this geometry of how things are wired up. So it all works yeah. together. I mean, Robert's tricky yeah. trying to say something. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that following up on Kevin's comment. So there was a group that maybe 20 years ago used FPGAs to, to evolutionarily simulate uh, performance uh, on specific com computational tasks. And they optimized their FPGAs up the wazoo. They did beautiful tasks at a specific temperature. And then they tried to figure out what, what, was, uh, what accounted for. They wanted to explain their FPGA performance. And it turned out that straight capacitance among the leads there was, was being selected for it. Not the location of the transistors, not the circuitry of the transistors, but the stray capacitance for God's sake. So that, that is a really humbling example that, that taught me at an early stage to respect the potential of epileptic interactions. Um, I'll see if I can find those hilarious stories, but um, it, it of, of course, for Earl's benefit, it did come out of MIT, I believe. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Must be true then. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think that we might be coming to an end. Are there any final thoughts, any pressing concerns or final questions that anyone wants to raise? Um, oh, one, one thing I put in the yeah. chat, um, neuromodulators. I mean, enormous forces that can totally Ab switch the state of a, of a cortex. Yeah. Which I think is is so central to thinking about oscillations because neuromodulators don't act on epileptic coupling on the coupling, they right. act on the circuit that it's creating the, circuit, the coupling, the, the, the constituents <laughs> of the circuit, the synaptic um, coupling, and also the individual firing properties, and that is like one of the really powerful knobs that nature uses to control the coupling of oscillations between uh, and within regions. I think that, that for me, that's yeah. exactly the argument that um, although the, the aggregate oscillatory level is a really interesting one and a necessary one to study, the aphaptic uh, level, although real, is, is perhaps not, it, it is real, but it's not where I personally am gonna be um, spending my research time or even thinking much about. Well, to each their own, but Tony, you just, you just articulated a pretty good way by you, which you can control the oscillation, thereby organize a uh, um, large scale excitability in the brain through uh, neuromodulation. And that can be quite precise. So you can actually control this these, uh, in a way that can actually have, then have an indirect influence on, on this, uh, um, these emergent properties that can then influence uh, 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 signaling in, in the brain. I guess my one last comment would be, if our brain doesn't work by rhythms, why do we have music? But, but, but well, I don't know how, how that would, everything I've said said it does work by rhythms. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right? So, so are, are we on the be, same page be, then? That would be a category I, I, for Earl. Like I, I, that, that has, like, I started off by saying that it does work by rhythms, that's a real thing. It's not the whole explanation, there's many layers beneath that. And that you know those the fact that it works by rhythms is probably evolutionarily ancient and maybe related to at least some people claim that locomotion was sort of the very first thing that evolved in the nervous system. Yeah. So it might be like the earliest principle for the organization of neurons in their interaction with the environment. I think we're on the same page. I think that locomotion is exactly right. sensation. Uh, yeah, so, some people, well, so I've heard the argument that the very first thing was locomotion because yeah. um, you, you got, you, the first question is, can you move? And then you have to decide where do you want to move to? Yeah. And chemo sensation is going to be important for that. But if if you can't use the chemo, it's no point in, in carefully teasing it apart, but that's a whole other discussion. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I think that if we if we could agree on how to to use words, um, we would probably discover that we agree on, on a great deal. Okay, all right. I think that might be the conclusion then. Let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's use words right. a little bit. Good discussion, better. guys. Good discussion. All right. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'll be posting this uh, online so that the discussion can continue <laughs> for a few more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take Thanks. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you.